Good evening, GYC. Tonight, I have the amazing privilege of introducing to you not only an inspirational speaker, but a dear friend of mine. Over the last eight years, the Lord has used David Ashrick and his ministry to touch my life in an amazing way. I know that I would not be who I am today if it were not for him and the ministry that he has had. The Lord has used him to bring in different people into our lives that have led me not only to change the course of my life, but to Mission College and to different places where I know that he is led of the Lord. And my prayer for you tonight as he preaches on the relevancy of crucifixion is that your hearts and your minds would be drawn not to the messenger, but to the giver of the message and to the giver of the Lord of David's life. May you all be blessed. Amen. All right. Thank you, Laura. Couldn't hear a word you said. Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. Is 2010 going to be a great year? I'm determined that it's going to be my best, boldest, and most unashamed of Jesus year yet. Anybody else want to say that? I'm on fire for the new year. Normally, I, I treat the new year with, with ambivalence mostly, but I don't know. I'm, I'm just I'm feeling very good about the new year. And I really like the idea of having the GYC over the new year. Do you like that? I think it's a good place. I think it's the best place, frankly, or one of the best places to usher in the new year. And my hope is we don't have to do too many more of these. Are, are you tracking with that? In other words, okay, great, you know, I like you, you like me, this is all fine and good, but it's, it's going to be better in heaven. Amen? Amen? So I'm all for the GYC. Love it, support it, enjoy it, want to spend my New Year's here, but I'll kind of look forward to, to the time when, when they're done. Amen? Amen? Well, did you have a good day today? Did you enjoy the seminars? Did you learn anything? Ah, now the, that, now the really important question. Are you going to apply any of it? Yeah, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. We have a lot we want to talk about, and we are going to be developing a series of three presentations. I'm so happy I get to preach three times. And um, I'm really, I, listen, it's one of those things where typically when I get asked to speak somewhere, they say, what's your sermon title? And uh, I don't know. I mean, they're asking like months in advance. Some terrible thing could happen. My, my life could change. How do I know what I'm going to preach four months from now? And so usually, I don't even usually know what I'm going to preach on Thursday. They'll say, do you have your sermon title and your hymns and your scripture? And I'll say, no, I'll, I'll know that tomorrow, Friday, the day before Sabbath. But somehow, when I was asked to speak at this year's GYC, when Justin called or whoever it was that called, I just knew immediately, maybe even instinctively, exactly what I was going to preach. And when I heard the theme, what is our theme this year? Oh, it sounds so good to hear you all say it. What is our theme this year? Unashamed. Wow, that sounds so good. When I heard the theme, I, I thought, that's a great theme. Amen? And I love the fact that it's rooted in Romans chapter 1, which is where we're going to be spending our time tonight. So without further ado, let us pray and then dive headlong into a study of Scripture. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we gather here confessing that we are, at times, ashamed. And yet the longing desire of our heart is to be unashamed. Father, this is not a confession of strength when we say we want to be unashamed. It is an admission of weakness. But we are thrilled to know that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Father, as we open your word, we need you to come and open us. We are in need of your spirit, the infilling of your spirit. Spiritual things are spiritually understood and discerned. And tonight we come in need of your inspiring, enlightening, and instructing spirit. Father, we don't want to just hear a good sermon, and I don't want to just preach a good sermon. We want to spend time with Jesus. We want to spend time with you. We want to be revived. We want to go home. 
So, Father, tonight may this be more than oratory. May this be more than elocution. May what happens tonight be a supernatural transaction in which the Spirit takes the preached Word and applies it, tailor makes it to every circumstance, personality, and situation. Father, we need revival. I need revival. And so tonight we are crying out for genuine revival. Speak to us through the message preached is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. So what's our theme, everyone? Okay. Sounds so good. As I was reflecting on what it means to be unashamed of Christ, I decided that it wasn't enough just to be unashamed of Christ in a general sense. The question that came to my mind and what I'm going to try and explain over the course of our time together is what does it mean specifically? What does it mean? What word, everyone? What does it mean specifically for a Seventh-day Adventist Christian living at this time in Earth's history to be unashamed? Are you tracking with me? In other words, there have been different periods, different epochs, different eras of time in which to be unashamed of Christ meant something very specific. What does it mean for me and what does it mean for you as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, or perhaps you're not a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you've just come and decided to hang out with us, but as Bible-believing Christians, what does it mean for me to be unashamed of Christ? I think it means three things. How many things? Three things. Well, let's just think of our name. Okay, we are Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Let's say that together. We are... Seventh-day Adventist Christians. What does that name mean? What does that name, Seventh-day Adventist, communicate? Well, I think it communicates three things. First of all, Seventh-day. Seventh-day is an allusion to the Sabbath. The Sabbath, scripturally speaking, has two primary theological significances Number one, the Sabbath is rooted in salvation and redemption. Can you say amen? Yeah. Right? Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, and the Sabbath is a sign that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And so when I tell someone I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, what I'm saying in part is I honor and keep the Sabbath because I believe that God is my Redeemer and God is my Savior. Amen? Amen? So as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian then, being unashamed of Christ for me means I'm unashamed of the crucified Christ. So far so good? But the Sabbath has another significance. The Sabbath is also rooted in creation. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night. We believe, as Chester did, just did a very good job of communicating and Amy did a great job of communicating last night, we believe in a literal six-day creation that took place in the recent past. Can you say amen to that? We'll talk more about that tomorrow night. But, but as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I am also unashamed of the creative Christ. Amen? That's the seventh-day part, the Sabbath. Unashamed of the crucified Christ, unashamed of the creative Christ. And what's the second part of our name? Seventh-day Adventist comes from Latin Adventus. Adventus means arrival. What does it mean, everyone? The arrival. We're, oh, we're waiting for someone to come. We're anticipating someone's arrival. I wonder who that might be. Whose arrival are we anticipating? You tell me. Jesus Christ. So, so what does it mean for me, David Ashrick, and what does it mean for you, John, Mary, Tom, whatever your name is, what does it mean for you to be an unashamed Seventh-day Adventist Christian? I think it means three things. We are unashamed of the crucified Christ. We are unashamed of the creative Christ, and we are unashamed of the coming Christ. Can you say amen? amen? We're going to talk tonight about being unashamed of the crucified Christ. Now, it is not insignificant and not serendipitous 
that our name and the significance of our name is actually rooted in what many might call our Magna Carta. That's Revelation chapter 14, what we refer to colloquially as the three angels messages. Maybe you'd like to just join me there briefly. Revelation chapter, where am I going? Revelation chapter 14. And here in Revelation chapter 14, we'll talk more about this tomorrow specifically and uh, certainly on Saturday. But just take a look at this. Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse 6. John says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. What's the very first thing we learn about this angel? Having the what? Having the everlasting gospel. So the very first thing we learn about the first angel that's flying in the midst of heaven is he has the everlasting gospel. Now notice what the angel that has the everlasting gospel says. Uh, to, preach to, ever, uh, to preach to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. So this is a judgment hour message. There's an urgency. There's an immediacy here. And worship Him who what? Made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. That's creation. We'll talk about that tomorrow night. Now notice that you then have the second angel's message in verse 8, the third angel's message is in verse 9, 10, and 11, then you have 12, and notice what happens in verse 14. Then I looked, this is after the giving of the messages, then I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his head a sh hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle, and what's the word everyone? Reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was what? Reap. So right in the three angels' messages, do we see the gospel? Yes. Do we see creation? Yes. Do we see coming? Yes. That's why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because the message that God has committed to His last-day people and I think the name is a great name. We could have been called some other name, but I think the Seventh-day Adventist name is a great name because it holds out at the forefront the three central prominent features of our faith. Seventh-day, that's redemption, that's creation. Adventist, that's the arrival of Jesus, and it's all rooted, totally, completely rooted in the three angels' messages. Can you say amen? amen. So we're going to talk tonight about being unashamed of the crucified Christ unashamed of the crucified Christ, and we're going to go, of course, to Romans chapter 1. So join me there. It's our central text. It's our theme text. We go to Romans chapter 1. Justin took us here last night, and uh, hopefully many more will be taking us there as well. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Rome, and he begins with the word for. What's the word, everyone? The word is for. Take a look at the first word of verse 17. Tell me what that word is. For. Take a look at the word, uh, the first word of verse 18. What's that word? How about the first word of verse 20? For. Paul is setting out a case. He's setting out a what did I say? He's building his case. Paul is very logical. Paul is very linear. You would even perhaps say that that Paul is clinical in his setting forth of the gospel. For this, for this, for this, for this. In fact, who wrote the book of Acts? Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke wrote the book of Acts. Listen to some of the adjectives that Luke uses to describe how Paul presented the gospel. In Acts chapter 17, verse 2, 18, 4, and 19, 24, and 25, he says, Paul reasoned. He, what's the word, everyone? Reasoned. In Acts chapter 7, he alleged. In Acts chapter 9, verse 22, he even goes so far as to say... All right, we good there? Oh, come on. Work with me. So Luke says that he reasoned, that he alleged, and that he proved. Are we together on that? So, so what is Luke saying? Luke is saying that when Paul went into the synagogue, when Paul was, was amidst a group of people, a congregation of people, he was setting forth the case for the Messiahship of Jesus in a logical, scriptural, and linear manner. Amen? We find him doing that here in Romans. Look at what he says. Not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. 
for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now you could make a case, it would not be impossible or even difficult particularly, to make a case that these are two of the most important words in all of Scripture. In fact, you could make a very strong case for the fact that these two passages of Scripture... Somebody just wants to get me a handheld mic, so I don't keep going in and out. So whoever you are, please bring me my sword. You could make... Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. You could make a very persuasive case that the entire bedrock foundation of the Protestant Reformation is founded in these two verses. Martin Luther came across that phrase, the just shall live by what? Faith. Now, I know that he's quoting from Habakkuk, but he was exposed to it in Romans. Romans chapter 16 and 17, we find the Apostle Paul setting forth his case, and he does so in a very logical, very linear, even a very clinical manner. And I learned a new word this week. I love words. You might be able to tell. I learned a new word this week, and I'm curious if anyone knows this word. The word is litotes. You were just using that yesterday, weren't you? Litotes. Does anyone know what that word means? Yeah, I wouldn't expect it. I didn't either. The word litotes is, is actually a very interesting word. It's, it's a rhetorical device in which you derive an affirmative by stating the negation of the contrary. It's crystal clear now, isn't it? See? You're going to be using it all the time now, litotes. Basically, Paul is, Paul is actually employing uh, the, the litotes device, a litotic device here. What he's saying is he's stating his case in the negative. He says, I am not ashamed. Right? It's deriving an affirmative by stating the negation of a contrary. I am not ashamed. You take shame, which is something that you would not want to be, and then you state it in the negative. I am not ashamed. Why does he frame it this way? Why does he purposefully frame the setting forth of his argument, which is a very systematic, very profound argument, which begins in Romans 1 and moves very powerfully, gaining momentum all the way through into the, the final chapter of Romans, Romans chapter 16. Why does he set it forth in the negative? I am not ashamed. In fact, if you look up a variety of English translations, you will find that almost unanimously, every translation renders this, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. I came across only one translation, the CEV, that renders it in the positive, and it has Paul saying, I am proud of the gospel. But it misses the point. The reason that Almost all translations render it in the negative is that the underlying Greek is framed in the negative. My question is, why? Why not just state it in the positive? I'm proud of the gospel. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Well, the answer is so simple that you might have missed it. The only reason you would state that you are not ashamed of something is if there was probable cause for you to be ashamed of it. Are you tracking with me? So he's coming out and he's saying, I'm not ashamed. Well, why frame it that way? Because in the days of Paul, there would have been significant shame associated with the message he preached. He says he's not ashamed of the gospel. Ashamed of the what word, everyone? The gospel. Now, the center of the gospel is a man named Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was crucified. Now, let's just talk here a moment about crucifixion. Let me just give you two quotations, both semi-scholarly sources, one of them scholarly and one sort of a popular source. But listen, it says, the goal of Roman crucifixion was not just to kill the criminal, but also to mutilate and dishonor the body. What was that last word there? To dishonor the body of the condemned. In ancient tradition, an honorable death required burial leaving a body on the cross so as to mutilate it and prevent its burial was a grave dishonor. There it is again. 
Under ancient Roman penal practice, crucifixion was also a means of exhibiting the criminal's low social status. It was the most, here it is again, dishonorable death imaginable, originally reserved only for slaves. So what's the recurrent word here? What's the recurrent word? Dishonorable. In other words, it, it's easy to kill somebody. You just thrust a sword through them. You, you thrust a spear through them. Why go to all the trouble of crucifying them? Well, sure, because there's more pain, sure, because it's torturous, etc. But the primary reason for inflicting crucifixion, incidentally, the Romans didn't invent it. Invent it. They likely got it from the Pers Persians or the Carthaginians, but they perfected it. They turned it into an art. They kept a man balancing ever so precariously between being dead and being alive, and they liked to suspend him there. Historians tell us that some people spent as many as seven days on the cross. It wasn't just for the purpose of killing. That's easy. The Romans were master executioners. They turned death into an art. The, the purpose of crucifixion, it was reserved to dishonor. What's the word, everyone? To dishonor. Secondary source here. Second quote. The social stigma and disgrace associated with crucifixion in the ancient world can hardly be overstated. It was usually reserved for slaves, criminals, of the worst sort from the lowest levels of society, military deserters, and especially traitors. Among the Jews, it carried an additional stigma because Deuteronomy 21, 23 states, a hanged man is accursed by God. And this was understood by the Jews to mean that the very method of death brought a divine curse upon the crucified. Now think about this. Paul is coming to Rome. He's coming to the regal city, to the imperial city. All roads lead to Rome. Rome wasn't built in a day. When in Rome do as the Romans. Paul is coming to Rome, and he's now writing of Rome, and he's going, writing to Rome, and he is going to be preaching a gospel, a good news, a message that is centered on a crucified Jew. The whole purpose of crucif crucifixion was to stigmatize the person that had undergone the punishment. Is there cause, contextually and culturally, for being ashamed of this message, yes or no? Yeah, uh, absolutely. The people in Paul's day would have regarded the veneration of a crucified person and furthermore, a faith system founded on a crucified person as the height of folly. I mean, you're kidding, right? You're going to tell us. Let me just get this right. Let me just, I want to be sure I heard you right there, the hearing aid. He, he. Let, me make, let me make sure I heard you right. You're going to tell me about a crucified deliverer. Just let that sink in. Crucified deliverer. You're going to tell me about someone who couldn't deliver himself from this hideous, ignominious, stigmatized punishment, and he's going to deliver me? There was a tremendous stigma attached. This is why Paul purposefully, intentionally, employing this, this rhetorical device like Totis, he perfectly, pur purposefully states his case in the negative. I am, what are the words, everyone? Not ashamed. Crucifixion communicated two things in Paul's day. High crime, low social status. High crime coupled with low social status. Both were sources of shame in Paul's time, so he purposefully communicates it in the negative. Now, let me just read to you just a fascinating little statement here. This is from uh, a book written, actually it's a series of sermons by D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He preached on the book of Romans in the Westminster Chapel every Friday afternoon from 1955 to 1968. It took him 13 years to get through the book expositorily preaching on the book of Romans. Can you imagine? Thirteen years of sermons. Fascinating. Listen to what he says. Why then is it that the world ridicules the gospel? It is because the message which the gospel conveys. The gospel proclaims, the preacher of the gospel has to proclaim, him who was born in utter abject poverty, born in a stable, no room at the inn, brought up in a little village, trained as a carpenter. That is the one whom we preach. That is the one whom we hold before the world, one who was crucified in apparent weakness. Having made exalted claims for himself, he is taken in utter helplessness. He is nailed to a tree and dies while the mob jeers at him and derides him, saying, Ah, he saved himself. 
he saved others, let him save himself if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. That is what we proclaim. We proclaim a carpenter, one who lived a life of poverty and who died upon a cross. And of course the world scoffs at it and ridicules it in its heart. But we assert that this selfsame person is the Savior of the world. And the Son of God, to the Jews this was a stumbling block, and to the Greek the height of foolishness. So the very character of the message tends to produce this ridicule. And as I say, man by nature does not like being ridiculed, so he is ashamed of the gospel. And this is the temptation. Paul frames his, his affirmation of his confidence in Christ in the negative purposefully because he knew that the, the promotion and the publishing, the widespread publishing of a crucified deliverer sounds almost oxymoronic. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever been ashamed of the gospel? Have you ever, ever been ashamed of Christ? Well, yes or no? <laughs> now what is that? Is there someone here who will say, I've been totally ashamed of Christ. Yeah, join the club, me too. Incidentally, so probably too was Paul's number one understudy, a man by the name of Timothy. Join me in 2 Timothy chapter 1, if you would. 2 Timothy chapter 1. This word here, ashamed, occurs, this particular Greek word that is rendered ashamed, occurs some 11 times in the New Testament, and we're going to look at most of them. 2 Timothy chapter 1. I'm in verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8. Timothy was a young man. Easy for us to remember his name, Timothy, rhymes somewhat with timidity. And this was probably his struggle. Paul writes to young, timid Timothy and says, beginning in verse 8, Therefore do not be, what's the word? Ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. What's he saying? Don't be ashamed of of Christ. He continues, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Look at the confidence he's speaking with. But now he has been revealed, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, notice what he says, I am not what? Same language in Romans 1. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. Can you say amen? and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day. Look at what he says now to Timothy. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me. We think of Paul as a popular guy. No! He says, I went to Asia. Everyone abandoned me. No one wanted to pay any... No, everybody pretended like they didn't know me when I went to Asia. Everyone turned away from me, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously, apparently unlike the others, and he found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. Three times, Paul's beginning his second letter to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I know you're tempted to timidity. I know you're tempted to be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed of my chains. You're reminding me of Hermogenes. You're reminding me of Phagellus. You should be like Anisiphorus because when he came to town, he couldn't wait to find me. He knew I was in chains. He knew that I'd been rejected and that I preached this crazy, wild, seemingly uh, insane message of salvation to the world based on a crucified Jew. He says, don't be ashamed. Now, 
Beloved, the only reason that Paul would write these things, not once, he doesn't say, oh, casually. He doesn't say sort of, you know, off the cuff, serendipitously. Oh, by the way, he gives this counsel because he knows that Timothy is tempted to timidity. He knows that Timothy is tempted to be ashamed. He knows that this is a struggle for Timothy. There's reason to believe, and and if I had time, I could develop what I believe is a case, a persuasive case, that Paul himself struggled with this for a time, but he got the victory over it, which is why he announces with such boldness to the church at Rome, what does he say right at the outset? I'm not ashamed. There would have been significant cultural reason for Paul to have felt shame. I mean, are you kidding? You're preaching the salvation of a world, of the world, from a crucified Jew in Roman society? The whole purpose of crucifixion was to stigmatize. The whole purpose of crucifixion communicated high crime and low social status. And you're going to tell us about a crucified deliverer? Do you not hear the inconsistency in that language? Fascinatingly, Jesus used this word as well. Go with me to Luke chapter 9. And in Luke chapter 9, he actually used it also in the Mark account. Mark records it in Mark 8, but we're going to look at the Luke account. Luke chapter 9, verse 22. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 22, it says, uh, verse 21, And he strictly warned them and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be, what is the word there, everyone? and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and be raised the third day. Then he said to them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his what? Take up his what, everyone? Cross. So Jesus here is speaking about rejection. Jesus here is speaking about being, uh, about being killed. He's speaking about suffering. And then he says, If you're going to come after me, you're going to have to take up your cross. Now, I remind you that Jesus was a man. That Jesus was a man who walked and talked in the same way that you and I walk and talk. uh, talk. He learned the way that you and I learn. Yes, he was God, but at some level he must have laid aside those divine attributes. He experienced life as you and I experience life. Jesus must have known. Jesus must have some level it known, whether God revealed it to him or whether with his uh, brilliant brain he just put it together that if he was going to die a hideous, ignominious death at the hands of the Jews, they were going to have to bring him. He knew that the Jews couldn't execute capital punishment. They would have to bring him to the Romans, and he knew that they would push for crucifixion. So Jesus here is, I believe, anticipating. He's, he's aware that when he dies, it will almost certainly be a, a crucifixion. And so he basically says, fellas, listen, it's not all going to be happy-go-lucky. I'm going, to go, I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be killed. And I can just imagine the response of the disciples. What's this guy talking about? Man, when we joined the Messiah Club, we couldn't wait to chop the heads off of the Romans, and now he's talking about getting killed? We want to do a little killing of our own. And Jesus must have sensed the incredulity. He must have sensed the surprise. And so he turns to them and he says, Hey, i got news for you. If you want to be my follower, you're going to have to pick up your own cross. Take up your cross and follow me. Now look at this, verse 24, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Now look at verse 26. In the immediate context of his rejection, in the immediate context of his crucifixion, which he anticipates, look at what he says. For whoever is, what's the word? Ashamed of me and my words. What words? Well, the words that I'm going to be crucified. Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Beloved, this word doesn't appear that many times in the New Testament. Go look it up. It's 11 times. We've looked at eight of them already. This word doesn't occur. When this word comes up with two exceptions, it is in the context of the crucified Messiah. When this word is used, with two exceptions, and we'll look at one of them in just a moment, it's in the context of the crucified Messiah. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed. He writes to Timothy three times. He says, don't be ashamed. Others were ashamed of me. Don't you dare be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed. Jesus here, he says, hey, fellas, I got news for you. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to suffer. And he anticipates crucifixion. He knows it's coming. At some level, and I'd like to think that he just put it together. He figured out, I'm going to be crucified. He senses the incredulity. He senses the surprise, and he says, hey, you take up your cross. 
Do not be ashamed. In fact, he goes so far as to say that whoever is ashamed of me, the crucified Christ. Hear it again. Crucified Christ, Christos, Messiah, anointed, the, the crucified deliverer. You're kidding, right? The crucified deliverer, if you are ashamed of me, the crucified deliverer, he says, I will be ashamed of you. And beloved, with two exceptions, we've looked at every use of this word, this particular Greek word right now. We've looked at them. We're going to come back to the third in just a moment because it is fascinating. Is the message clear so far, yes or no? Why would Paul announce it in the negative? Because there was a cultural stigma attached to his crazy message. In fact, it's almost, it's imperative for us to go very quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Join me there. And here we get a feel for the, the, the intensity of the radicalness of the message preached. Look at what he says here. Very similar, by the way. Very, very similar. 1 Corinthians 1 to Romans chapter 1. Many of the same themes. Right? Romans chapter 1, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. The, word, the phrase power of God occurs three times in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The word save, the word faith, the word believe. They're very, very similar. So check this out. Beginning there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 18, for the message of the cross. What's the message, everyone? What's the message, everyone? The, what is it over there? I, don't, I can't hear you. What's the, what's the message? It's the message of the cross. Look at what he says. The message of the cross is what? Foolishness. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, say it with me, it is the power of God. That's what he says in Romans chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God. He says, man, people look at the message we preach and they think, you've lost your mind, you're loony. You preach that salvation of the world, salvation for me, salvation for my family comes through a crucified Jew. Again, I've got to say it. A crucified deliverer? You're kidding, right? Paul says the message of the cross is foolishness. It's outright, it's folly, it's the height of folly. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the, the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And Paul calls out here almost rhetorically. Again, Paul was a kind of debater. He was, he was adept. He was brilliant. He was very capable of using uh, rhetorical and, and forensic devices to make his case. Where is the wise, he says, almost challenging, almost defying. I mean, Corinth at the time was, was arguably, it, it certainly rivaled Athens and may have been the greatest city in the Greek Empire at the time. The greatest city in Greece would be a more correct way of saying it. He's writing to the Corinthians. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the, your Bible says, disputer? It's literally debater. It's like he's, it's like he's picking a fight. Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made, what's the word, everyone? Foolish, the wisdom of this world. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through it. Here it is again, the foolishness of the message we preach, which he just told you was the message of the cross. Please God through the foolishness of the message we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek after what? Wisdom, but we preach, here it is, look at the juxtaposition, we preach, what do we preach? Christ, that's Messiah. That's deliverer. That's anointed. We preach the Messiah crucified. It's foolishness. Absolutely, totally, completely foolhardy, and Paul knew it. In fact, a little bit later in this epistle, he says, hey, we're all going to be fools for someone. I'm going to be a fool for Christ. We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, it's foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, here it is again, the power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen, here it is again, the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise and God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things that are mighty. Weak, yeah, like a crucified person. You can't get any weaker than that. 
and the base things of the world, base, despised, abominated. The base things of this world and the things which are despised, there it is. He's, he's talking about the cross and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not. This was a, a way that the ancients would speak with, 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 with this, they just, when they wanted to say that something was lowly, it was beneath their recognition, they would say things that are not. It doesn't even deserve, exi- it's a thing that is not. And Paul says God has taken those things. Paul says that God has taken the things that are not, the things that are despised, the things that are base, and God has chosen to use those things to confound the wisdom of the worldly wise. Paul was an unashamed preacher, not just of the Christ, not just of the coming Christ, not just of the, of the creative Christ. Hey, anyone can believe in that. Creative Christ, that's good news. That's power, that's strength, that's might, that's majesty. Coming Christ, that's sword, that's slaying, that's returning. No, 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 no. Paul is preaching the crucified Christ. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in His presence, but of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that it is written, He who glories, let him glory. Where are we going to glory? In the Lord. Now look at this. Jump down there, verse 2 of of the next chapter. For I determined not to know anything among you, except here it comes again, Jesus Christ and Him what? The anointed deliverer crucified. Some of you are tempted to laughter. Paul anticipates it everywhere. It's funny. You're really going to come to our town? You're going to come to Rome? You're going to come to Greece? What happened in Acts chapter 17 when Paul rocks up there to the Areopagus and, and Paul starts promoting, he starts, you know, some of your Greek poets have said this, and I bring a message to you from the unknown God, and we're like children groping around in the dark, and they're like, oh yeah, this is good stuff. We, because the world loves philosophy. The world loves intellectualism. The world loves for people to stand up and to sound smart and to sound good. And then he says, I preach to you Christ, whom God raised from the dead, and it's like the record stops. And then the Athenians begin to look at one another. What? Are you kidding? Who is this babbler? The guy's lost his mind. A crucified Jew is going to save us. And you're really, I mean really, really, you're going to come and talk to us and tell us that our salvation depends on a a crucified Jew? Paul says it's foolishness. But he says, when I came to you, man, I just decided, I made up my mind that when I came to you, I was not going to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him, what everyone? Crucified. The intellectual hostility that Paul faced is identical to the intellectual hostility that we face today. And that intellectual hostility manifests itself with religionists and secularists. In Paul's day, the religionists would have been the Jews, and they would have said, you're kidding, right? It was a scandal. And the so-called secularists, sure, they were religious, but they were religious only in the sense of, of religion being a part of Greek society in, a very, in very broad strokes. They were the secularists, not exactly akin to our materialists, but close enough. And basically what he says is, the religionists want a sign. Prove to me that what you're saying is true. And the secularists, the Greeks, they, they want wisdom. That's what they're seeking after. And beloved, that's the same kind of hostility that we face today. Because we're not as wild as the Pentecostals. I'm a, I speak it in tongues and God is doing... We're just the lowly Seventh-day Adventist church. We don't have all of the accoutrements and frankly don't want them. We just have a Bible and we have a message. That's it. Well, I, I don't want to have to work a miracle for you to believe the gospel. The gospel is believable on its own terms. And the secularists say to us, Ah, oh, well, it's not intellectually credible. Well, my response is Paul's response. God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. Beloved, the Apostle Paul was in an, in, in, an, in, an, in an environment that was far more hostile than ours. In fact, let me just read you something very interesting here. This is from Barnes on this very topic. He says, It is worthy of remark also that to the ancient philosophers, this doctrine would appear still, still more contemptible than it does to the people of modern times. Everything that came from Judea they looked upon with contempt and scorn. They would spurn above all things, all things, uh, the doctrine that they were expected, that they were to expect salvation only by the crucifixion of a Jew. Besides, the account of the crucifixion has, has now lost no small part of its reputation of ignominy. 
even around the cross, there was conceived to be no small amount of honor and glory. In other words, he's saying, we now regard, because the world has become so Christianized, we now regard the cross in a positive light. We now, you know, we think the cross, self-sacrifice, the cross, magnanimity, the cross, selflessness, the cross. We, we, we wear it on our, well, you don't, but people wear it around their neck and they, they put it on their cars and they hang it at the cross. It's a, beloved, in first century, they didn't have all of these centuries. They didn't have these centuries of, of, of venerating the cross and the God of the cross. Paul's walking around and saying, yeah, the Messiah was crucified and you should believe in him. Oh, and somebody's saying, well, what about the resurrection? Beloved, you couldn't even get to the resurrection. The record stopped at Messiah. <clears throat> but to the ancients, it was connected with every idea of ignominy. With them, therefore, the death on the cross was associated with the idea of all that is shameful and dishonorable. There's our words again. And to speak of salvation only by the sufferings and death of a crucified Jew was suited to excite in their bosoms only un mingled scorn. Let me just put that in, in modern language. They thought it was stupid and they hated it. Paul was in a more intellectually hostile climate than you are. Are you hearing? You think, oh, well, I'm so afraid to speak. You know, people in my university, they're going to think I'm weird. <laughs> the intellectual hostility that you face is less than half of what Paul would have faced. For, for, for a variety of reasons, one of which is the, the, the point that we're making here, and that is that the cross, the crucifixion, the concept, has lost much of its stigma. In fact, it's, it's valued by many as an object of veneration, an object of selflessness. Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, man, when I showed up in Asia, people pretended they didn't even know me. Phagellus and Hermogenes, I said, hey, Phagellus, what are you running for? Who are you running for? some of us are like, oh, you know, I, here goes. God bless you. <laughs> right? I mean, isn't this us? Isn't this us? Tell me you can't relate. You're in a restaurant. Thank you. I mean, it's like trauma for us. Paul comes marching into cities, and he's like, uh, can you show me the most prominent location, please? I, I've got a message. I've got an urgent message that everyone needs to hear. Gather around. Oh, there's an urgent message. There's a man. He's traveled many, many dozens and hundreds of miles. There's an urgent message. Is this the location? Okay, you're all gathered here today. Beloved, I preach to you Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, a man crucified. What? We're going to beat the tar out of this guy. <laughs> We're done with him. We're done with his babbling. Beloved, you have this vision. I have this vision of Paul the hero striding confidently through the cities of Asia Minor, riding into Philippi and into Galatia, people believing by the hundreds and by the thousands, flocking to the great and mighty Paul. The only place that happened in is when they thought he was Apollos and they thought that the other was Mercury. And when they found out that he wasn't, then they tried to kill him. People hated this guy. Reality check time. We think we're going to go gliding in because we got a WWJD bracelet. Yeah. <laughs> Unashamed, baby. <laughs> right? Just tuck it up under your sleeve. Beloved, I, I, you, you get the point. I, I want to close with this. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, Verse 14, he says, But God forbid that I should boast. I want you to hear this. Oh, Paul was a real person. He, he didn't like to be rejected. I think that's why he's so affirmative. I think that's why he's so engaging right at the outset of Romans. He says, I'm not ashamed. And so Paul writes, he's a real person, and he says, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross. Everybody's going to look like a fool, and I'm going to look like a fool for Jesus, he says. 
Now, I told you, I told you there was 11 occurrences. We've looked at most of them. Romans 1, 2 Timothy 1. We didn't look at Mark 8, but it's very similar to Luke chapter 9. We've been through basically all of them. But let me show you one of the ones that is not related to the crucified Christ. This term comes up, it's almost always in the context of the crucifixion, right? Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the crucified Christ. He says to Timothy, don't be ashamed of the crucified Christ. Jesus says, don't be ashamed of me, I'm going to be crucified. But let me show you one of the two instances where this does not, it's, it's so thrilling. Book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews, go there with me if you would. We have very good reason to believe that the Apostle Paul wrote it. I'd like to think that he did, but even if he didn't, the point stands. But it's more powerful still if he did. Hebrews chapter 2. Where are we going, everyone? Hebrews chapter 2, and I am in verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm in verse 9. Look at this. This is awesome. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, or as some translations put it, who was made lower than the angels for a little while. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Hallelujah! Beloved, that's the gospel. That's the gospel that Jesus died. Jesus died the death that you deserved. Jesus lived the life you have not lived. And Jesus' resurrection is your only hope of a future resurrection. Can you say amen? That's the gospel. The gospel is not a philosophy, and it sh certainly isn't a concept. The gospel is a person. It's the good news. It's a statement of facts about a person, and that person is Jesus, and Jesus is God. The gospel is the good news about God. Taste of death for every man. Look at this, verse 11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. Now, this is a little complex in the Greek, but basically what he's saying is, those that are being sanctified and those that are sanctifying are all... And those that are sanctifying, that's Jesus are all members of the same family. Members of the same what? That's basically the point. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. Now look at this. Here it is. Here it is. For which reason? Because he's a member of your family. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. There it is right there. Same configuration, my friends. Same word. Whoo! I hope you didn't miss it. If you missed it, you weren't paying attention. Paul says, I'm going to live my life unashamed of Christ. I'm going to live my, I'm going to exhort Timothy, don't be ashamed of Christ. We're going to be fools. We're going to preach the crucified Messiah. We're going to preach the crucified deliverer. I'm going to go to Athens. I'm going to go to Asia. People are going to hate me, but I'm going to preach the crucified Christ. And when we get to the book of Hebrews, I'd love to think that the Spirit inspired Paul to write it. Paul says, Consider Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels so that he could taste death for every man. And then he says something fascinating. He who sanctifies and he who is being sanctified, that is God and you, are all members of the same family. And for that reason, Christ is not ashamed of Paul. Paul was not ashamed of the crucified Christ. And the crucified Christ is not ashamed of the struggling, failing, sometimes falling, Paul. Christ glorified, not ashamed of the unglorified Paul. So how is it? I ask you at the outset, have you ever been ashamed of Christ? Silence. Psh, as if that question needs to be asked. It's not a person in this room who hasn't been at some fundamental level. People are going to say, oh, that's a manipulative technique, blah, blah, blah. Give me a break. If we were not ashamed of Christ in the way that we would like to be and should be, there wouldn't be a GYC 2009. You say, you can't read my heart. I can't read your heart, but I can look at the evidence. We're still stuck here. That tells me that we have to some degree taken our light and we put it under a bushel. 
But I've decided for me, beloved, and, and, and I don't want my promises and resolutions to be like ropes of sand. I'm, I'm pleading with God to make me a man like Paul. 2010, Lord, I want to be bold. I want to be unashamed. I want to be hated for Christ's sake. 